Hello, my name is Lionel, and this is my wife Kim, and we are the Carltons. I'm Griffin, this is Cammie, and we're the Stroops. Hey, I'm Phil, and this is Jenny, and we're the Wrights. I had Tanya on December 28th of 2008. I started to be consumed with worry and anxiety about money. We'd always been told that we wouldn't be able to get pregnant. And so um, when we did, it was a really big deal. We weren't able to save anymore, and then we ended up having to use our savings to pay for bills and rent every month. After about 10 weeks of being pregnant and seeing the baby a couple of times, we, um, we found out that it didn't look good. Basically, and they said that he wouldn't walk and talk and function like a normal child. At the 10-week mark um, was when we actually lost the, the baby. These were my plans that I wanted to happen. You know, we went from uh, two full-time working parents you know, with two fully functional children to you know, her being a stay-at-home mom, taking care of a, a severely handicapped you know, infant. So I was just trying to find you know, another contract here and there, whatever I could get. You know, simple things turned into to large arguments. I'm screaming at my other two kids. Seeing the savings account that I found so much security in dwindle away. All of a sudden the baby's gone and now you're not sure how to feel. Why would you do this? Why would you put us through this? So we really struggled through a lot of that together. We started examining, you know, how is our attitude towards what God has provided for us. There was a, uh, a lady from my son's school who created a Prayer Warriors for Tanyan Facebook page. We, we, we talked about it on that page. You know, today, you know, Tanyan had five seizures and it was a day that, you know, we didn't really think that we were gonna make through. Understanding that really we are not in control. It's a difficult situation, but it doesn't need to be miserable. There were people who were waiting for us to ask for help. We, we decided to go ahead and start trying again. We tried to give a little bit more. We are now 18 weeks pregnant with twins. If the Lord wants to wipe out our savings account during this period, then that's fine. He, he will still provide. This was God's way of, of not only testing my faith, but strengthening my faith. I'm thankful that God chose us to, to raise this special child. He has given us so much that how could we not be thankful? That we're thankful for every day um, that we're trusted with this lab or these labs. <laughs>to see a purpose church today we're going to continue our fall series in the wilderness with today's study blessings in the wilderness as opposed to cursings in the wilderness now, throughout this series we've seen that we're more vulnerable to certain things when we're in the wilderness for example we talked a few weeks ago about comparisons in the wilderness how we're more uh, tempted to compare ourselves unfavorably to other people when we're in the wilderness we talked a few weeks ago also about complaining in the wilderness how we're more tempted to complain when we're in the wilderness like the Israelites did than when we're not in the wilderness uh, next Sunday I'm going to talk about a uh, fear in the wilderness how we're more vulnerable to being fearful when we're in the wilderness than when we're not. Uh, but today I want us to look at how God turns curses into blessings in the wilderness. Even when we feel like we're being cursed in the wilderness, God is going to turn that around into a blessing. Now, I want to make this sermon practical for you. And so I want you to think of any situation in your life right now, uh, any problem in your life or any person in your life that you feel is attacking you or even trying to, quote, curse you with their actions or with their words and you're feeling the hurt and the pain and the, and, and the fear and, and the loneliness and the stress and discouragement of being vulnerable of that curse in your life. I want you to think of that situation 
or that person or that problem in your life right now, uh, kind of lock it in and apply what we're talking about from God's Word to that specific situation within your life. Uh, someone sent me this the other day about pastors, um, and I'm not sure if it's just during the pandemic or in general, but I imagine something similar has been going on in your profession as well. So I don't just want to whine as a pastor. I imagine uh, that whether it's during COVID or even pre-COVID, uh, that, that you struggle with many of the same things that pastors uh, struggle with in their uh, particular uh, profession. 97% of pastors have been betrayed, falsely accused, or hurt by their trusted friends. 70% of ba pastors battle depression. Uh, 7,000 churches close each year. Uh, 1,500 pastors quit each month. Only 10% of pastors will retire as a pastor. 80% of pastors feel discouraged. 94% of pastors' families feel the pressure of ministry. 78% of pastors have no close friends and 90% of pastors report working between 55 and 75 hours uh, per, per week. Uh, and so uh, that may be true in your profession as well. It certainly, at least this research shows, is true uh, for pastors. But the big idea for today's message is this. Here's the big idea. God is in the business of turning curses into blessings. Wherever you're sitting there in your living room, at your computer, listening later on in your car, wherever you are right now, would you say, uh, I'm going to read that again, and you say with me, amen. God is in the business of turning curses into into blessings and say it together with me now, wherever you are, amen. Uh, I had something happen last Sunday that was just so cool. Uh, we were visiting our daughter Abby and, and her family in Washington, D.C. And so last Sunday we went to a church together in Virginia. And the pastor used De De Deuteronomy 28 verse 7 as his benediction. I'd never paid much attention to that verse. It hadn't jumped out of the Bible at me until that moment it just jumped right out of the pastor's mouth, and, and it's particularly because he used it as a closing benediction. So we go up to talk with him after the service, and he asks if he can pray over our family. And he uses the story of Nehemiah that's in your study outline. Now, uh, I'm not going to cover it today, but I would encourage you to use it uh, this week as part of your uh, Bible study time. And so use it as a, an additional study that goes, the study of Nehemiah that goes with our study this morning. Of, of Balaam. And he used those exact verses from Nehemiah along with that particular benediction. Well, a few hours after that great time at, at that church and with that pastor, just a few hours after that, Katie Chow, uh, who's a member of our board of trustees, emailed me those exact same verses from California. And so the same verses in Virginia, same verses from California. So from coast to coast, God was shouting these verses uh, at me. And I'm going to do the same thing to you this morning. Here they are. Deuteronomy 28, verse 7. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. They will come at you from one direction, but will flee from you in seven directions. That, that problem you were thinking of earlier on, that, that critic, that, that person uh, that you were thinking of as somebody who's cursing you or that situation in life, that problem that's cursing you. It's going to come at you from one direction, but God's going to intervene and it will flee from you in seven different directions. Luke 10 verse 19 is another one that Katie uh, sent to me. I've given you authority, Jesus said, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. <clears throat> maybe the main reason that you're watching or listening to this right now is to hear those four words. that In that situation that you're so afraid of right now, nothing will harm you. Here's the next one that Katie sent to me. 1 John 5, verse 18. <clears throat> we know that anyone born of God does not continue to sin. The one who has been born of God keeps them safe. And the evil one cannot harm them. And then one that I added <coughs> is uh, Genesis 50, verse 20. 
You intended to harm me, Joseph says to his brothers who uh, sold him into slavery in Egypt. He says, you intended to harm me, but God, but God, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. And even through all the hard things we go on, go through in our lives, this is the end result. This is the thing we're looking for, to save many lives for eternity. No matter what we go through in this life, if it serves the ultimate purpose of people going to heaven, of saving <coughs> many lives, if it serves that purpose, then it has been worth it. Whatever you're going through, whatever I'm going through, it's worth it. If the end result is the saving of, uh, of, of many lives. Remember, back to our big idea. God is in the business of turning curses into blessings. Now, with that in mind, uh, let's look at the story of Balaam in the Bible. Now, Balaam is one of the most complicated people in all the Bible. Uh, there was a good Balaam and a bad Balaam. And today we're going to look at the good Balaam, but I encourage you in your Bible reading this week, uh, read the whole story, because it's a complicated story, because there's times when he's good, and there's times when he's bad, uh, or not so good. But we're just going to focus on the good Balaam here today. Uh, first is King Balak, the king of Moab, his request. Picking up now in Numbers 22, verse 1. Then the Israelites traveled to the plains of Moab and camped along the Jordan across from Jericho. Now Balak, son of Zippor, saw all that Israel had done to the Amorites. Uh, and Moab was terrified because there were so many people. Indeed, Moab was filled with dread because of the Israelites. The Moabites said to the elders of Midian, this horde is going to lick up everything around us as an ox licks up the grass of the field. So Balak, son of Zippor, who was king of Moab at that time, sent messengers to summon Balaam, son of Beor, who was at Pethor near the Euphrates River in his native land. Balak said, a people has come out of Egypt. They cover the face of the land and have settled next to me. Now come and put a curse on the nation of Israel now. Put a curse on these people because they are too powerful for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to defeat them and drive them out of the land. For I know that whoever you bless is blessed and whoever you curse is cursed. Now we don't completely understand what's going on with Balaam here, but somehow he had the reputation that if he blessed somebody, they were blessed, and if he cursed somebody, they were, they were cursed, and so people would give him money to do a blessing or a cursing on that person, and Balak, as we see, is, is willing to put out a whole bunch of money to get him to curse uh, the nation of Israel. The elders of Moab and Midian left, taking with them the fee for divination, that is the, the money they were going to give Balaam for cursing the nation of Israel. When they came to Balaam, they told him what Balak had said. Spend the night here, Balaam said to them, and I will report back to you with the answer that the Lord gives me. So the Moabite officials stayed with him. God came to Balaam and asked, Who are these men with you? Balaam said to God, Balak, son of Zippor, king of Moab, sent me this message. A people has come out of Egypt, covers the face of the land. Now come and put a curse on them for me. Perhaps then I'll be able to fight them and drive, uh, and drive them away. And then skipping down to verse 16. This is what Balak, son of Zippor, says. Do not let anything keep you from coming to me because I will reward you handsomely, give you a lot of money, and do whatever you say. Come and put a curse on these people for me. But Balaam answered them, Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything great or small to go beyond the command of the Lord my God. There's good Balaam saying, I don't care how much you pay me, I'm just going to say what God want, want tells me to say. I'm just going to do what God wants me to do. I'm going to say what God wants me to say. And I know that many of you in your place of work uh, are under great pressure uh, ethically to do certain things that maybe would displease the Lord. And, and Balaam is a great example here of saying, I don't know how much money's involved. I'm I don't care about that. I'm going to do the right thing. 
do what God uh, tells me to do. Now spend the night here so that I can find out what else the Lord will tell me. That night, God came to Balaam and said, since these men have come to summon you, go with them, but do only what I tell you. And now we come uh, to the first blessing. So he's hired to curse them, but look what happens here in Numbers 23, verses 1 and 2. Balaam said, build me seven altars here and prepare seven bulls and seven rams for me. Balak did as Balaam said, and the two of them offered a bull and a ram on each of the altars. Uh, skipping down now to verse 5. The Lord put a word in Balaam's mouth and said, go back to Balaam and give him this word. So he went back to him and found him standing beside his offering with all the Moabite officials. So Balak hired him, all the officials, uh, the leaders of Moab are there. Here comes the curse. Then Balaam spoke his message. Balak brought me from Aram, the king of Moab, from the eastern mountains. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me, denounce Israel. How can I curse those whom God has not cursed? Uh-oh, going, going in a different direction than they thought. He's about to curse them. And it said, how can I curse those whom God has not cursed? And how can I denounce those whom the Lord has not denounced. And, and, and so he, he, goes, he, he goes to curse him. He's hired to curse him. And yet God tells him to do a blessing instead. And that situation in your life right now that seems like a curse, God is going to turn that thing in to a blessing. That person that is cursing you, God's going to turn that into a blessing. That problem in your life, God's going to turn that into a blessing. That situation in your life that feels like a curse, God, like he did through the mouth of Balaam, is going to turn that thing into a blessing. The reason you God led you to watch this today is because he wants to encourage you about that thing that seems to be a curse in your life that God's going to turn it around into a blessing. Skipping down to verse 11. Obviously, Balak is upset about this. Balak said to Balaam, what have you done to me? I brought you to curse my enemies, but you've done nothing uh, but, but bless them. And, and Balaam answers, must I not speak what the Lord puts in my mouth? Which leads us to the second blessing. Uh, Balak uh, thinks, uh, well, I, I just got to get him in a different spot. If I take him to a different location, I'll get a different result. Uh, verse 13, then Balak said to him, come with me to another place where you can see them, and from there, uh, curse them uh, for me. And now skipping down to verse 16. The Lord met with Balaam and put a word in his mouth and said, go back to Balak and give him this word. So he went to him and found him standing beside his offering with the Moabite officials, and Balak asked him. It's like an attorney in, in a court of law. You know, they say, never ask a question of a witness that you don't know the answer to. Always know the answer before you ask the question. And Balak asks a question he doesn't know the answer to, and it's not going to turn out uh, well for him. What did the Lord say? Then he spoke his message. Arise, Balak, and listen. Hear me, son of Zippor. God is not human that he should lie, not a human best being that he should change his mind. Does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? I have received a command to bless. He has blessed and I cannot change it. And then just like he did with the other time, he goes on to do this massive blessing of the nation of Israel. And Balak is just beside himself. Skipping down to verse 25. Then Balak said to Balaam, neither curse them all nor bless them all. He says, hey, if you're, at least if you're not going to, Curse them for me. At least don't bless them. Uh, verse 26, Balaam answered, Did I not tell you I must do whatever the Lord says? And so the, 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 that situation, those people, they're trying to curse you. You almost feel like Satan is coming after you. But, but remember, God has the final word. Did I not tell you I must do whatever the Lord says? And even though they intend it, uh, the situation intends it, uh, to be a curse. God has the final word and we must do 
whatever the Lord says. So then Balak took Balaam to another location. You got to hand it to him. He is persistent. He thinks, um, if I just get him in the right spot, I'll get the result that I'm looking for. Same thing happens again, the, the third blessing. He, he does another uh, massive uh, third blessing uh, to go with the other two. And now Balak is just, just completely losing it down in verse 10. Then Balak's anger burned against Balaam. He struck his hands together and said to him, I summoned you to curse my enemies, but you've blessed them these three times. Now leave at once and go home. I said I would reward you handsomely. And let's hold it here for just a second. But the Lord has kept you from being rewarded. Do you ever feel that by doing the right thing, the ethical thing, um, in the workplace, in your family, in whatever situation you can apply this to, that God has kept you from a financial gain. Oh, you, you hang in there. You do the right thing. Um, and in the long term, God is going to bless you for it. And I know sometimes it feels like God is keeping us from a reward because we've got to do the ethical thing. We've got to do the right thing. Uh, we've got to do the honest thing. But you hang in there because eventually uh, God will bless you. Uh, going on to the next one now, verse, verse 12. Balaam answered Balak, did I not tell the messengers that you sent to me? Even if Balak gave me all the silver and gold in his palace, I could not do anything of my own accord, good or bad, to go beyond the command of the Lord. And I must say only what the Lord says. Now I'm going back to my people, but come, let me warn you of what this people will do to your people in the days to come. Then, uh, to go with his three blessings of Israel, Balaam proceeds to give four more messages, bringing down a curse on Israel's enemies. So he gives seven messages all together. The first three are blessing Israel, even when he was hired to curse Israel. And then the next four, four, five, six, seven, uh, those four messages, if you read it there, uh, in, in, in that passage, uh, God is bringing down a curse on Israel's enemies. And that's what God will do for you. That's what he'll do for me. When you're a follower of Jesus Christ, the, those curses come. He turns them around into blessings. And then it boomerangs back on the situation, back on the person. Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Just leave it in God's hands and God will God'll take care of it. Moses says in Deuteronomy 23, Verse 5, however, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but turn the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. Let's hold it there for just a moment. That's what he's going to do. I, I, I believe, if not now, and in heaven. I promise you it'll happen in heaven. But it's your pastor who loves you and wants the best for you. I'm praying it's sooner rather than later. That's what I'm praying I, I'm praying it's now. I'm praying it's tomorrow. I'm praying it's, it's this week. But even if it's not, even if it's later in your life that you see it, or even if it's not till you get to heaven, I promise you he is going to turn that thing you think is a curse into a blessing. Why? Because the Lord your God loves you. He loves you. He knows that situation you're in. Turn it over to him. He loves you. And he's going he's gonna to turn it around from a curse into a blessing. Now, I just want to begin to wrap things up with an observation about this story. And, and this, this carries a bit of conjecture with it. So this is not um, thus saith the Lord. This is uh, Glenn doing, Pastor Glenn doing a little bit of conjecture here. But it's interesting to me that as, as Balaam called down this blessing, got him up in the mountains so he could oversee the camp of the, of the nation of Israel. And as he overlooked the camp there of Israel um, and blessed them, I think it's interesting to surmise or to conjecture that only the Israelites that were a part of the nation of Israel got the full blessing. I mean, if they were off somewhere else, if they were wandering away, uh, from the camp, uh, maybe they still got a blessing wherever they were in the world just before, because they were the Israelites, just because they were God's people. But I believe that they got the full blessing when they were there in the camp together with the nation of Israel. 
And I believe that it is only followers of Christ who are connected to the body of Christ, the church, that get the full blessing. Uh, there are no, they're not meant to be any Lone Ranger Christians. God says, I, you know, I think a Lone Ranger Christian out by themselves, they receive Christ as their Lord and Savior, and then they're kind of out there doing their own thing. Okay, I, I think they will receive some blessings. They, they can be saved. They can um, be forgiven. They can be on their way to heaven. But, but Lone Ranger Christians don't get the full blessing of God that they would get if they were connected uh, with the local church. Uh, now, now, during COVID, that can certainly mean online as well as in person. Certainly means you get that blessing connected to the church online as, as much as in person uh, or as well as in person. Uh, but the Bible says in Hebrews 10, 25, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing. Uh, let's never give up that hope that we'll get back to God's ideal, which is meeting together and not get into the habit of not being together because I believe that that's where the full blessing uh, lies. I just read an article this past week, just absolutely um, remarkable. Uh, it was based on research from Harvard University. So this was not some Christian, um, I, I don't even know if the researchers were Christian. This is a secular source. This came out of Harvard University that called Christians not connecting with each other in church. They called it, and these are, these are secular, this is coming out of Harvard. They called it a public health crisis. Uh, the title of the article was this, Empty Pews are an American Health Crisis. This from Harvard. Empty pews in church are an American health crisis. And then, then under, underneath it, it said this, Americans are rapidly giving up on church. Our minds and bodies will pay the price. And this is not some pastor talking. These are scientists talking. Uh, the one particular scientist that is quoted the most in the article, even though it, it was gleaning from oh, hundreds of different research projects, at least dozens of of different projects from all over the place, different researchers. But the main one quoted was uh, Tyler J. Vanderweel. And he is a professor of epidemiology, epidemiology uh, and biostatistics at the Harvard School of Public Health and director of the Human Flourishing Program at Harvard University. And, and he would challenge, in his just in his research, I don't even know if he's a Christian or not, but just in his research, as a researcher at Harvard, he would challenge the whole idea that is so prevalent in, in our culture and society today that I'm spiritual but not religious. That, you know, I'm, I'm a spiritual person, but I'm not religious. Okay, he said that, that may be the case, but you're not going to get the full blessings or benefits of being connected with other believers. And it wouldn't just be Christians here. It would be... Um, uh, he would be talking about those in um, Islam and mosques. He would be talking about uh, Jews, uh, Jewish people in, in synagogues. Uh, but predominantly the people in their study were Christians. And so he's talking about Christians in, in churches. And so he would challenge the whole idea of people being spiritual but not religious. Or, or he would say, in the article, he'd say, uh, those that have doubts about organized religion. I'm just going to kind of be a lone ranger out there on my own because I have doubts about organized religion. By the way, if anybody that you're sharing Jesus with, they said, you know what, I just don't care for organized religion. You just tell them, come to Purpose Church. We are really disorganized at times. At least our pastor is. You just tell them. Oh yeah, you, you, if you don't want to organize religion, we understand that. Pastor Glenn, he's very disorganized. So, so you, you come here. This is what you've been looking at. But he, but he would say, he would cast doubts on those that doubt organized religion. He's saying you just don't, you may get benefits uh, from your, your religion and, and you may be, get benefits from following God on your own, but it will not be the full benefits you get by being connected to other believers in the church. For example, he would even favor, this is from Harvard now, okay, including, you know how your doctor always gives you a bunch of questions about your health and well being? And I was just um, so interested. Last time I went to the doctor, just a couple of weeks ago, 
he asked all kinds of questions I never had asked of me before, and I, I didn't want to waste his time, but I was just so curious. I, I kept wanting to stop him and say, why do you ask that question? For example, I've never had a doctor go through and how many years I was in each state. So, you know, in Virginia for 17 years and then four years in Illinois and then three years in Massachusetts and 12 years in New York and now 28 years here in California, he he, mapped, he he wrote all that down where I had lived. And I, I just wanted to stop him and say, why is that that you're asking where I lived? And it's just fascinating, all the different questions. Sometimes you can infer he's asking the question because if you give a certain answer, it increases your health and well-being. Well, he would even maintain that one of the questions your doctor should ask you is, do you attend religious services? Uh, why would he think that that would be a prevalent question along with, you know, how much you drink or, or, or do you smoke or, you know, if you're overweight or, or, or all the other things that they ask. Why, why would he ask, how often do you attend religious services? Because there is now tons of research that supports the idea that religious participation strongly promotes health and wellness. Tons of research that supports this idea that religious participation strongly promotes health and wellness. Um, one study that he cited was the Nurses Health Study, which followed more than 70,000 medical workers for 16 years. They watched 70,000 medical workers, I think primarily nurses, for, for 16 years. Uh, those who attended, these are just amazing to me, those who attended church frequently were 29% less likely to become depressed, about 50% less likely to divorce and five times less likely to commit suicide than those who never attended church. Out of the, this is the, just the stunning finding of their research. Out of the 70,000 healthcare professionals, those who attended church weekly were 33% less likely to die during the 16 year follow-up period than people who never attended church. Over the next 16 years, if you attended church regularly, you were 33% less likely to die over that 16 year period than those that, that never attended church. Uh, he also found that in, in other researches that he cited, growing up in church helps to shield children uh, from the big three dangers of adolescence. Big three dangers of adolescence, number one, depression, number two, substance abuse, and number three, premature uh, sexual activity. Those are the big three. Growing up in church uh, protects you somewhat, not entirely, we know that obviously, but, but protects you statistically on average um, from those big three. Research shows that people who grow up in church are more likely to grow up happy, to be forgiving, to have a sense of mission and purpose, and to volunteer than those that did not grow up in church. One study indicated that religious service attenders had far fewer, quote, deaths of despair. Deaths of despair are, are defined in the medical community as deaths by suicide, drug overdose, or alcohol, um, uh, far fewer than people who never attended services, uh, reducing those deaths by 68% for women and 33% for men. One researcher finds that, this is just amazing to me, one researcher finds that declining religious service attendance accounts for about 40% of the rise in suicide rates over the past 15 years. A number of large, well-designed research studies have found that religious service attendance is associated with greater longevity, less depression, less suicide, less substance abuse, better cancer and cardiovascular disease survival, less divorce, greater social support, greater meaning in life, greater life satisfaction, more volunteering, and greater civic engagement. Aren't you glad that you watch church today? <laughs> Aren't you glad? I mean, the sermon may have been boring, but you're going to live longer because of it, <laughs> all right? Even if the last 30, 
three minutes or so, or 32 minutes, even if they bored you to tears, you're going to live longer just because you watched uh, today. Uh, just remember the big idea for this morning. God is in the business of turning curses into blessings. And now let me close with this blessing that the high priest of Israel would pray over the nation of Israel every night before they went to bed. The, the, the priest would stand out and look over, just like Balaam looked over the nation of Israel and over their camps of all the Israelites and prayed a blessing over them as led by God. So every night before they went to bed, the high priest would stretch his hands out uh, to the nation of Israel as I'm doing to you right now and would pray this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. And all God's family said, Amen.
and their children, and their children, and their children. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you, all around you, and within you. He is with you, He is with you, in the morning, in the evening, in your coming, and your going, in your weeping, and rejoicing. He is for you. He is for you, 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 he is for you. for you, he is 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 for you, he is